Welcome to the Sunday panel. Tonight, the politics of free speech. After the attacks in Paris, including on a satirical magazine, it's become a championed cause. But it's also under pressure, not just from extremists, but from the governments protecting us from them. In the aftermath of the mass murder in France, millions marched and everyone seemed to support freedom of speech. But in the following days, dozens were detained in France for hate speech, anti-Semitism and glorifying terrorism, including a controversial comedian for his Facebook post saying, Je me sens Charlie Koulibaly, a reference to the hostage taker. Meanwhile, in the U.S., Fox News openly condoned mass killings. We need to kill them. We need to kill them. The radical Muslim terrorists hell-bent on killing us. Controversial and still legal, but free speech may get new limits. Bomb them, bomb them, and bomb them again. On Friday, the British Prime Minister urged the U.S. President to get Facebook and Twitter to hand over data to intelligence agencies. Social media and the Internet is the primary way in which these terrorist organizations are communicating. There's fear of terrorism here, too. The RCMP tried to stop this man. They had words, but not enough to arrest. We could not arrest someone for thinking, uh, for having radical thoughts. It's not a crime in Canada. He fatally ran down a soldier last year, and now there are growing signs that in Canada, more police power and less free speech may be coming. Tonight, we're joined by our Sunday panelists. John Moore is a talk radio host in Toronto. Tasha Carradine is a columnist with the National Post and iPolitics. And Supriya Devetti is a communication strategist specializing in government relations. So, Tasha, I'm going to start with you. We saw two days after that massive rally in favor of freedom of speech, even when it's offensive, you had all of these arrests for offensive speech. What, what was your reaction to that? I'm very troubled by that, Wendy, because the whole point, I think, of the rallying that took place after the Paris attacks, the marches, uh, the solidarity shown by different nations was in favor of free speech. And the reaction you see is the exact opposite to that. And yes, people said very offensive things. The Charlie Coulibaly comment could be taken to offend people. But the whole point was Charlie Hebdo was offensive and we supported the right of it to be so. And I think unless you're calling for action, which uh, was implied in the clip you ran in, of the uh, Fox News saying you should kill people. You should, unless you're saying that you should, you should do such things, I think you should be protected because you're not inciting hatred, you are expressing an opinion. Supriya? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Tasha, but I think at the end of the day, we have to realize that f France and Western Europe generally has very restrictive laws when it comes to free speech and when it comes to hate speech. So I, I think it comes, it's part of our North American ignorance to, you know, come out in support of France and say, yeah, just we Charlie, when we don't really understand that their legislation is, in fact, quite restrictive. There was a case, John, in, in Halifax this week that <laughs> suggesting that there was a bit of a double standard. He's just a guy who runs a hot dog stand, and he tweeted a Holocaust joke about, like, Jews and ovens, of all things, to argue there's a double standard here that why is it okay to insult Muslims and not okay to insult, insult Jews? There was a complaint. The police are looking into it. I mean, it... Where do we, should it be a crime? What it, what it, or is there, is he right? Is there a double standard? Here? No, I think he's absolutely right. And I, I, John Stewart put it so perfectly after Dieudonné, this uh, controversial uh, comedian in, in France was arrested. He said, just be confused. <laughs> um, you know, and, and some of the very same people right now who are making such a stink about time to depict the prophet Muhammad, time to tell jokes about Islam. Uh, these are the same people who are losing their stuff over the elephant dung Mary and piss Christ. And so... Absolutely. And, and then, you know, there's sort of insulation that you might enjoy. I mean, remember, just before she died, Joan Rivers was in trouble for a Jewish joke. And she said, hey, my parents were in the Holocaust. Don't tell me what's funny. So I think it comes down to the fact that there's taste and then there's freedom. And freedom is absolute. Taste is something else altogether. What did you think of the, the hot dog guy? Like, should he be <laughs> able to make jokes about the Holocaust? 
I, I mean, we're all allowed to, to make jokes, but whether or not, you know, the whole point of living in a free society is that you're allowed to tell a joke and I'm allowed to say, I think that joke is unfunny and stupid. And so I think having that sort of dialogue is what makes our society so great. Um, the fact that he was shut down and possibly, you know, I think they cited him for inciting violence or in, inciting hate against an identifiable group of people. He's I, apologizing. Now. Right, and he is apologizing. I think it's good that he's apologizing. But that sort of dialogue is, is what we need. We don't need to just shut people down for telling a, an offensive joke. Yeah, and the, the notion of inciting hatred, that is obviously open also to interpretation. Does he incite hatred or is he simply expressing, as he said it, to make a point um, saying that, you know, this speech should be as protected as other speech? I think that that's a big line we have to look at, too. In France, obviously a problem with terror. There's, mm -hmm. We have problems here as well. A lot of people are afraid. Uh, in France, the, the law says that condoning terrorism is against the law. It's not here. I mean, should we, should John, should well, we? What is condoning terrorism? I mean, I don't want to really start mixing it up over specific incidents because I'll probably get the hate mail. But, you know, if you write <laughs> the wrong thing about Israel and Palestine, are you condoning terrorism? Uh, you know, and it, 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 you know, condoning terrorism will always depend on which side the other person supports. So I think you should be allowed to have your political free speech. You should be allowed to have a sense of humor. And again, it comes down to this matter of are you inciting violence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the condoning is uh, something that should be allowed in the sense that it's an expression of someone's opinion, whether something happened was right or not. Um, there was a piece published after the attacks on in Paris and USA Today by a radical Muslim cleric justifying them and saying in very great detail why this was a justifiable act. And while I found it incredibly offensive to read, I actually, it made me understand why someone might have this mindset. In a way, you need to know what other people are thinking if you are to understand how to combat what it is they are doing. So there's talk, perhaps, rumors that the, the, the law could be changed here to make condoning terrorism a crime in Canada like it is in, in France. But there's other talk, too. Uh, the British Prime Minister has been urging uh, the U.S. President Obama to hand over data on Twitter and, and, and Facebook. There's, we can get into that in just a moment, but there, there's other hints, too, of change. We've got the Public Safety Minister, Stephen Blaney, uh, and the RCMP Commissioner, Bob Paulson, in the last little while, saying that Canada needs more police powers. Here, here's what they said. We need to have those laws that make our uh, RCMP more able to adjust to this evolving threat. I'm of the view that in some areas, we need to be able to lower the threshold. So that threshold is about making it easier to limit the freedoms of someone, to have a peace bond which could lead to arrest, maybe without a warrant. What, what do you think of that, Sapria? I think it's scary, and I think we have to worry about a slippery slope. And, and, and I think they have to really demonstrate, and by they I mean the, the government and, and you know, Mr. Paulson, really need to demonstrate to us as Canadians why exactly the current mechanisms aren't working. It's all good to talk a big, a big game and say we need more powers, we need more tools, but we currently have tools and you need to show us why they're not working and why you're not using them to the best of their abilities. Natasha, the government's obviously going ahead with something. We don't know exactly what it is, but they mm -hmm. said they're going to be tabling legislation in the next little while. It is something more. They, they said that they could have perhaps stopped Couture Rouleau in uh, saint jean sur richelieu if they had had more powers. Well, so, some of the powers that they're asking for, um, which include sharing of information between organizations ending the sort of silo effect I think is just common sense and we, we know that's probably going to be part of it and I think that goes to the issue of whether you need to change the evidentiary threshold because if you are able to collect more information as we from different sources as we could now if they talk to each other maybe you'd be able to meet the threshold that exists currently and not have to go down that slippery slope that you're talking about but how far down that slope <laughs> that is the question. Well, I'm, st I'm still giggling over the notion that there has to be some sort of an agreement about Twitter and Facebook. I mean, Twitter and Facebook are about as out there as they possibly could be, so I don't know what security agencies are going to do with that. Um, but this is, and I'll confess, Supriya, where I sell out my civil libertarian uh, <laughs> principles. Yeah. And that is that uh, I, I would be open to a few more powers. Uh, preventative detention, for example, so long as there was a time limit on it. Uh, perhaps some surveillance powers. The only caveat I have is absolutely there must always be a warrant. Well, uh, Bob Paulson is on the record saying maybe in some cases not. You well, know, that's when I'll scream. Uh, well, this is a, it's funny because I would I scream more at the notion of preventative detention unless there's an imminency, and that would be if you not needing a warrant. I would I would say yes only in cases where there was an imminent threat. If you knew that someone was planting a bomb in an hour, for example. So there's but a in, time crunch. Yeah. Yes. In general, though, preventative detention is to me the greatest deprivation of liberty. You have to be very careful before you go down that road. Because you have not yet committed a crime, but you're exactly. suspected that 
you could. I mean, are your civil libertarian bells going off? <laughs> I mean, yeah, mine are, definitely. Um, and I think, I, I think we should all be worried about that as a society. And we have to be, you know, have that conversation of what we're willing to lose in order to possibly gain, if it is, even is a gain at the end of the day, in terms of security. Mm -hmm. Well, and we've been hearing that there was information and is ongoing information. Our police sources tell us that there's stuff happening online and, mm -hmm. uh, and that they need more powers to be able to go in and, and, and see this. But to do that, there, are, there is private messaging on a number of social media sites. I mean, should there be? There's been suggestions of shutting some of that down or giving police more access to that. Would you allow that? Into the shutting down all private messaging because there may or may not be a few bad eggs out there? I think that's a little extreme. But What about allowing police to look at it? I, I, without a warrant, again, I, I still, I'm, I'm with Tasha on this in, in that I think it, you, there needs to be an imminency. If you can prove an imminency, if you can prove that somebody, you know, you have reasonable suspicion to suspect that they are in fact planning something over social media, then sure. But do I want all of my messages to be read by the police? No. One thing worth noting, though, is that we came up with uh, extreme powers. Well, you can call them extreme, but new powers after September 11th. They were never used, not even for the Toronto 18. They were never used. So I, I'm not sure exactly what is necessarily handcuffing our police forces or security forces now. Well, I think that things have changed, though, since, since uh, the Toronto 18, because the Toronto 18 did not succeed. I think that what's really changed is the public mood, and the government knows this because of the attacks in Ottawa and Quebec City. And we have to be careful not to have a knee-jerk reaction to that. But the reality is that there is a greater threat, I would argue, in Europe and also here than we faced before. So where is the slippery slope? You know, like, the, should you... The, we hear that there are people communicating mm -hmm. online, and if they could see it, they have suspicions about these people. And if they could get in there and see who's doing it and get a, a heads up. Yeah, you know, Wendy, I, I, have, <laughs> I, I have issues with anonymity on the internet, period. And I think that's one of the issues that we have to look at as a society generally. People say and do all sorts of things because they are not exactly that. They can't be tracked and traced. And you would need a lot of powers for the police to do that. In terms of monitoring, though, I would prefer to have perhaps an increase in monitoring, but less of an increase in actual deprivation of liberty, i.e. preventative detention. So just spying on us. <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like to use that word, but I think more intelligence gathering in the current climate might be a good idea. Well, and obviously somebody has to have given a reason to be suspected. Right. right. Yeah, right. they're not just looking at our pictures of dogs right. and, and, you know, <laughs> love <Cat> letters <laughs> and cats flushing toilets, all of that stuff. I mean, I guess the average Canadian is probably more in favor of this because they don't imagine it's ever going to affect them. Mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, as, as somebody who is, you know, South Asian and I do have family abroad, I, like, I, I, my, I don't suspect my family abroad to be doing anything whatsoever, but I can't admit freely that I know what every single cousin that I have on both maternal and paternal side are up to. So th for me, this is where I, I think it's a, a much bigger deprivation of my own liberties or, or friends of mine that I have that travel abroad for work, perhaps, and that you want to be, you know, flagged by the and government. And this did happen in the United States after the Patriot Act that there were many people simply stopped, detained at airports, whatnot, because they were Muslim or because of the way they looked. And that's something I think we also have to be very careful not to do that. So people all over the world were there with their just be Charlie posters and so on. Has something changed? And, and are Canadians now more in the mood to be afraid, to crack down on radical Islamists. I have two suspicions, actually. I do think that Canadians may be a bit more predisposed, but I also think the more civil libertarian-minded are also ready for the pushback. So I think the government may be in for a bit of a surprise. Last quick point, Sabrina? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to agree with John here. And I think what the Canadians, what Canadians as a whole are starting to realize is that it's no longer the very orchestrated, organized attack, but more mm -hmm. so the lone wolves that we need to, lone wolves, rather, that we need to be wary of and need to be cognizant of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very, it's, it's a harder fight to fight against those individuals. And I think for that reason, people might be more open to increased surveillance because they feel more afraid. Well, the House is back in a little bit more than a week. Mm -hmm. And the Prime Minister said that there are changes coming. So we'll see what happens. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Sabrina. Thanks.